尊敬的侯伟斯根主席，各位朋友、各位同事，大家好。s i m u l t a n e o u s translation。回顾二零二三年，世界充满动荡不安，人类面临多重挑战：保护主义、泛安全化冲击世界经济、单边主义、集团政治、重创国际体系。乌克兰危机延宕加剧，中东冲突硝烟再起，人工智能、气候变化、太空基地等新的挑战接踵而来。今天我在这里要向大家传递的最重要的信息是：不论国际风云如何变幻，中国作为负责任的大国，我们将始终保持大政方针的连续性和稳定性。坚定所动荡世界中的稳定力量。第一，中国愿所推动大国合作的稳定力量。大国对全球战略稳定负有关键责任。习近平主席明确指出，大国竞争不是这个时代的底色。国际形势越动荡，大国越要加强协调；风险挑战越突出，大国越要增进合作。今年是中美建交四十五周年，历史经验的教训表明，中美合作可以办成有利两国和世界的大事，中美对抗，两国和世界都会遭殃。两国元首去年底举行重要的会晤，开辟了面向未来的旧金山愿景，中方将坚定维护正当合法权益，反对无理遏制打压。本着对历史、对人民、对世界负责的态度，与美方共同落实好两国元首的共识，推动中美关系沿着相互尊重、和平共处、合作共赢的正轨前行。俄罗斯是中国的最大邻国。中俄关系在不结盟、不对抗、不针对第三方的基础上，稳定发展，符合双方的共同利益，也有利于亚太和全球的战略稳定，为新兴大国关系做出了有力的探索。中国和欧洲，我们作为世界上两大力量、两大文明、两大市场。我们应该意识到双方承担的国际责任，一个更加稳定、紧密的中欧关系，不仅能够成就彼此，还将照亮世界。我们应排除地缘政治和意识形态的干扰，坚持伙伴而非对手的定位，共同为应对乱局，注入正能量，为共克时艰苦，提供新方向。Point the way for overcoming difficulties together. Second, China will be a force for stability in addressing hotspot issues. We have worked to explore a Chinese way of addressing hotspot issues, one that advocates for non-interference in internal affairs and opposes imposing one's will on others, upholds impartiality and justice, and opposes pursuing selfish interests. Seeks political settlement and opposes using force, aims to address both symptoms and root causes, and opposes myopia and one-sided conflict. The Chinese active mediation, a historic reconciliation was reached between Saudi Arabia and Iran, setting off a wave of reconciliation across the Middle East. This is a living example of implementing the Global Security Initiative put forth by President Xi Jinping. The recent escalation and the overthrow of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and the Ongoing tension in the Red Sea once again demonstrate that the question of Palestine is at the heart of the Middle East. Generations of the Palestinian people have been displaced, unable to return to their homes to this day. This is the longest-lasting injustice in our world. China has stood firm on the side of fairness and justice all along, vigorously working for an end to the conflict and for the protection of civilians. China pushed the UN Security Council to adopt the first resolution since the latest conflict broke out, 
和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和和
Chinese the Chinese economy is vibrant and resilient as ever, showing a more robust momentum for long-term growth. Last year, the Chinese economy grew by 5.2 percent, accounting for one-third of global growth. As China grows into the world's largest market rapidly, it will bring more dividends to the rest of the world. It is widely shared in the global business community that the next China is still China. Focusing energy on realizing Chinese modernization is the biggest political consensus of the Chinese people right now. Seeking faster progress in high-quality development is of paramount importance for China in the new era. As President Xi Jinping pointed out, China will only open its door even wider to the world. We will continue to expand institutional opening up, shorten the negative list of foreign investment, and foster a more market-oriented, law-based business environment up to international standards for companies from Europe and from around the world. Now, China has mutual visa exemption arrangements with 23 countries and applies unilateral visa free policy to multiple European countries. We will continue to provide more facilitation for people from around the world to invest, travel, and study in China. Today, rejecting decoupling has become an international consensus. More people have come to realize that the absence of cooperation is the biggest risk. Those who attempt to shut China out in the name of de-risking will make a historical mistake. The world economy is a big ocean that cannot be cut into isolated lakes. The trend toward economic globalization cannot be reversed. We need to work together to make globalization more universally beneficial and inclusive so that more countries and people can benefit from the process. Friends, a German proverb says, those who work alone add, those who work together multiply. This is also true for state-to-state -state relations. We hope that all countries can seek win-win and avoid lose-lose. Let us work together like passengers in the same boat to bring more certainty to the world and usher in a brighter future for humanity. That is my opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency, for your remarks, and thank you in your last remark to picking up the motto of this conference, which is lose-lose, but with a question mark, because uh, we want to look at a silver lining. And uh, um, thank you for, for um, um, participating in a, in a discussion. This conference, um, again, um, as in the last two years, was very much focused on Russia's aggression against Ukraine. We had yesterday the, the testimony of uh, Yulia uh, um, Navalny here. We had President Zelensky here. We have in the neighboring hotel, the Rosewood Hotel, we have an exhibition on the, um, on the horror, horror that the war brought to, to Ukraine. And um, I want to come back on this. And um, in 1994, the so-called Budapest Memorandum was agreed. Um, the Budapest Memorandum um, asked from Ukraine to get rid of all its nuclear weapons. And in return, Russia and others um, guaranteed its um, um, sovereignty and territorial integrity. 
Um, now, China at the time, member of Security Council, endorsed it, and um, your colleague, Sergei Lavrov, was the ambassador to the UN and made it to a document of the Security Council. This is where we, where we stand, and this is where we stood when um, two years ago the aggression took place, where this document of Security Council was not honored. Um, and um, uh, you mentioned that you have been active in trying to resolve the, the crisis, which we appreciate. And, uh, but at the same time, when you look um, at the economy, we saw that in 2022, the trade between Russia and um, uh, China increased by 30 percent. Um, this year, uh, no, uh, last year, it um, um, increased by 25 percent. Um, we are at $240 billion trade. Um, and my question to you, if I may, shouldn't you um, put some more pressure on Russia and um, also some economic pressure to make sure that what you said in your speech, the respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity is preserved and that we strengthen the UN? Because after all, this is a document of the Security Council which was um, which was violated by Russia. The Budapest Memorandum of was signed by the U.S., U.K., and Russia. China is not a party to the memorandum, but through a national statement, we recognize this memorandum. As we can't decide what other countries do, but on China's part, we have honored our commitment faithfully. We articulated clearly to the world that China will not use nuclear weapon against non-nuclear weapon states. And not first to use nuclear weapons against any country, including Ukraine. President Xi has stated that a nuclear war cannot be fought and a nuclear weapon cannot be used. This is something that all sides must be observed, and the new security of the nuclear facility must be protected. And China has fulfilled in international obligation. China did not start the Ukraine crisis or participate in it, but we did not sit idly by and watch it from a distance. We did not exploit the situation, but instead we've been facilitating peace talks. President Xi has stated clearly China's position, that is, first, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries must be respected, and second, the purposes and principles of the UN Charter must be fully observed, and third, the legitimate security concerns of all countries must be taken seriously, and fourth, all efforts that are conducive to peace must be supported. So, acting on those basic principles, China has been working relentlessly to promote peace, to promote peace talks. Now there are not the right conditions in place for parties to go back to the negotiating table, but as long as there is hope, we will not give up our efforts. The earlier the peace talks, then the loss of all parties will be reduced. As for China's relations with Russia, in my opening remarks, I said that the no alliance, no confrontation, and not targeting any third party, that is the principle. It's a normal relationship between two major countries. We are opposed to any attempt to blame China or to shift the responsibility of resolving the Ukraine to China. Well, China has done a lot of constructive work, and we will continue to play our positive role on this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for this um, response. Um, let me stay with um, business questions. In the last two months, um, two 
German companies, um, Volkswagen and BASF, um, came into trouble um, because over business dealing with uh, Xinjiang. There is Germany and EU have passed new regulations for um, human rights standards in, um, in supply chains and um, human rights situation for the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang is going to stay um, an, a political and economic issue. Um, you remember a couple of years ago there was a report of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, what can you do to resolve this issue and are you planning to, to do something so um, accusations about forced labors are no longer coming from your country? 关于中国新疆的事物啊，有些呃国际声音上不了太多的谣言，至少很多的虚假的信息。新疆自治区成立以来，我只介绍一些基本的数字。新疆自治区成立以来，我只介绍一些基本的数字。新疆自治区成立以
Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there is a worldwide recognition what China has done over uh, decades to bring so many people out of poverty into a, a have, uh, into the possibility to have a decent life. But I um, take up and uh, thank you very much for the offer also for visits in, in, in Xinjiang uh, so that people can see with their own eyes. Um, you mentioned um, trade, um, which is very important. We are seeing right now um, how the freedom of navigation is threatened in the Red Sea. Um, we see also that there are more and more risky encounters at sea in the Taiwan Street and the South China Sea, which um, is um, due to a Chinese show of force. Um, how can we avoid these incidents in the future? And is there a, ch is a chance that China agrees to a code of conduct for the South China Sea? <laughs> 呃,首先我要講是不能把台灣問題跟大家看。Well, uh, first I want to say that the Taiwan question cannot be compared with uh, what's happening in the Red Sea. The Taiwan question is China's internal affairs. Taiwan is a part of China. It has never been a country. Well, in 1943, China the United States and the United Kingdom issued the Carroll Declaration, and I see in the audience the Foreign Minister of uh, Egypt. It stated clearly that all the territories Japan has stolen from the Chinese, such as uh, Taiwan, shall be restored to China. And in 1945, the Potsdam Declaration was signed, which reiterated that the terms of the Carroll Declaration shall be carried out. So to ta for Taiwan to return to China is a basic requirement, and due to the Chinese Civil War, the two sides across the Strait have yet to be reunified, but it will be realized. This is the strong will of the 1.4 billion Chinese people and the trend of history. Now, who is opposing reunification and who is supporting independence? It is the DPP so, that, uh, seen, that's governing the Taiwan island. So to uphold the one China principle, one needs to support the peaceful reunification of China and to safeguard peace across the strait. It is essential to oppose Taiwan independence because Taiwan independence is irreconcilable with peace across the Taiwan Strait. When it comes to the South China Sea, the South China Sea Islands have all along been Chinese territory. And when China exercised administration over those islands, the countries surrounding those neighboring countries were not even established. But in the 1960s and 70s, when China was going through the Cultural Revolution, China's neighbors occupied some of the islands reefs of the Nansha Islands, which caused disputes as we see them today. But China has exercised restraint, and we've been pursuing dialogue and negotiation to resolve those issues, not like some major country which resorts to force easily, but China's approach is dialogue. So in 2002, China signed with the 10 ASEAN countries the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea, the DOC, which helped to safeguard freedom of uh, navigation and overflight in the South China Sea. And in recent years, China suggested that we upgrade that and negotiate a code of conduct in the South China Sea. And we agreed with ASEAN countries that the COC should be more binding, more substantive, and be in keeping with international law, including UNCLOS. 
Now the chat of the COC. Have, we have finished the third, three rounds of reading. We believe that as long as we work in solidarity with ASEAN and stay clear of distractions, we will be able to conclude a COC in the South China Sea. Between China and ASEAN countries, we have the wisdom and ability to safeguard peace and stability in the South China Sea and safeguard the freedom of navigation and overflight there and also safeguard the legitimate rights of other countries in this region. As for the Red Sea, it is a typical spillover from the fighting in Gaza. China has been calling publicly for parties not to harass the commercial ships in that area to safeguard the security of the waterway. And but actions must be taken in accordance with international law and with mandate from the Security Council. To address the Red Sea issue, the root cause must be resolved. And the root cause is the ongoing fighting in Gaza. China's position is clear on that. First, an immediate ceasefire must be realized. No more fighting. And second, to make sure the humanitarian corridors are unimpeded. And third, hold an international peace conference as soon as possible to revive the two-state solution. We cannot allow this humanitarian disaster to continue anymore. Nearly 30,000 civilians have lost their lives in the fighting. And there are also many lives who are lost, who were unaccounted for. We cannot allow the situation to continue in the 21st century. Now, generations of the Palestinian people have been displaced, unable to establish an independent state. We simply cannot allow the situation to continue. So there should be a more concerted voice. There should be a more unified position. We should call for a proper settlement of the question of Palestine, which has been lingering on for more than 70 years. Efforts should be made toward a two-state solution. Only when that is realized can the state of Palestine and the state of Israel live in peace and with assurance from the international community can enduring security be enjoyed by Israel. A country cannot establish its security on the insecurity of others. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency, for your readiness to take these questions, for the, your contribution, for the discussion. We really appreciate it. And uh, you ended up where we started with the Secretary General of the United Nations making a plea for the rules-based international order, for the respect of the UN, for the respect of UN resolutions. And we hope that this remains the common basis um, in the coming year. And um, can I already extend an invitation to you to come back next year? <laughs> uh, and the next year, China will continue to send a delegation on this arena. We stand ready to share our views with uh, all parties to make China's contribution to global peace and stability. China is the country with the best record in terms of peace and security. We have never started a single war, and we have never participated in a single war, and we have never tried to support other countries' uh, governments. China's development is, uh, represents a growth of force for stability and for peace. We hope that countries will view China's development in an objective and perspective and out of goodwill so that we can realize common prosperity and common development together to avoid the situation that is mentioned in the theme of this conference, a lose-lose situation. We need to seek win-win. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the next session will continue momentarily, so please everybody remain seated. We'll continue in just a moment.